So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. We're excited to have you for the second in our series of webinars for educators. Uh, our talk today is gonna to be very exciting. <clears throat> we have three folks here who are going to talk about designing learning for distance education. And I will turn it over to our speakers in just a minute, but I wanted to let you know that if you intend to receive Act 48 credits for this talk today, um, to please stay with us until the end and I will explain then how to receive them. Um, if you noticed, you can unmute your microphone to speak, but we ask that um, you enter things into the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat if you have any questions while our speakers are talking. And then at the end, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of the speakers. Um, so I would like to now turn it over to our presenters for this evening. We have Dr. Peggy Schooling, Ms. Rebecca Heiser, and Dr. Will Deal, and they'll introduce themselves to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, and welcome to our webinar on Teaching for Tomorrow, Designing Learning for Distance Ed. Uh, we want to thank you for the amazing work you're already doing and appreciate your time commitment this evening to join us because we know not only have you had probably a very full day, you've had a full week and a very full school year. So um, we also just want to share with you that um, this webinar is being brought to you in partnership with Penn State College of Education, the PA School Study Council, and the American Center for the Study of Distance Education, and WPSU. So I'd like to inter uh, introduce myself, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to my team members. Um, I'm Peggy Schooling. I'm the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania School Study Council, and I'm also a Professor of Practice in the Ed Leadership Program in State College. And so I have two roles and the one role with the study council is to um, serve uh, member districts um, and to provide technical assistance and professional development to the districts that are in our membership and they're all over the state. I also am very fortunate to be able to teach um, aspiring principals and superintendents in the education leadership program. And currently I'm actually working remotely from Lancaster. Uh, once we had spring break here, I left and haven't been back. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleague, Will, so that he can introduce himself. Okay, thanks, Peggy. Uh, it's great to be here, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Will Deal and uh, I'm a Pennsylvania native, born in Pittsburgh and uh, grew up in the Camp Hill area, went to Cedar Cliff High School. Um, I ended up going back to Penn State and uh, got my bachelor's in elementary ed, and I taught on and off through the years, and I got into technology after that. Um, I ended up going back to Penn State to get my, my PhD and uh, circled back after that, after a few years, and uh, I ended up uh, as a faculty member in the uh, Lifelong Learning and Adult Ed program. Um, I'm also the... Uh, uh, associate editor for the American Journal of Distance Ed and the director of the American Center uh, for the Study of Distance Ed, which Peggy just talked about us being uh, one of the uh, partners in, in this project. Um, and uh, I'm also the co-editor of a new handbook of distance education uh, with uh, Dr. Michael Moore. Uh, and if you get into distance education uh, research, you'll see his name around as well. So. Um, I will pass it over to Rebecca, thanks. And thank you, I am Rebecca Heiser. I am the lead instructional designer for Penn State's Lifelong Learning and Adult Education um, online graduate program that Will previously just mentioned. I'm also um, not only instructional designer, but the applied research coordinator with Penn State World Campus. Um, so I, I really look forward to our conversation and our presentation with you tonight. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Will. Oops, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, jumpy here with our slides. I think it's I me. Apologize for that. No? It's okay. you, Peggy. No, I think it's, it's you. Okay, I think it's me, okay. All right, so we do, before we get started, just to put things in context a little bit, um, you know, we know COVID, has really created a lot of challenges for school systems. And it's not just in the United States, it's across the globe. We've all been affected. You know, it's been challenging in particular for teachers and parents and students. And you know, at first we were in this crisis mode and now we're starting to shift to be more purposeful in our teaching and learning. 
And so we've learned a couple lessons, I think, too, that you know, partnerships with families have become more important than ever. I think we've learned that social emotional learning is really becoming a critical com component of teaching and learning. And that, you know, some ineffective approaches in the classroom are also ineffective in the digital spaces too, and vice versa. So I, I think today as we move towards um, distance education, for us, our goals really are to help you develop an understanding of distance education terminology and how it relates to your practice as a teacher. Because there's a lot of confusion out there and Will will talk about that. And then to recognize like the relationship of technology to distance education pedagogy. And we're really going to ask you to think about it in terms of a focus on learner centered approaches. And then lastly, Rebecca is going to spend some time talking about, you know, really three important types of interaction in distance education that are really, really critical to having high quality um, teaching and learning for kids when they're in distance education. And so with that, I'll turn it back over, I think, to Will. Right, okay, thanks. So I'm going to just kind of, uh, uh, my colleagues promised to bring the cane out and pull me off if I start going too deep into, dis into the history of distance ed. But um, I'm going to just give you kind of a short overview of, uh, of history here and Penn State's uh, relationship as well um, to that. So, so as, as far as distance education, as soon as the first postage stamp and postal service provided opportunities for common people to send letters to one another, correspondence courses started to happen. And, um, there was a movement in New York in the, in the 1880s called the Chautauqua Movement. Uh, and uh, the gentleman who was a founder of the movement, John H. Vincent wrote in 1886, and I actually pulled the book off my shelf. I have this, this uh, first edition book of this published in 1886. And his, he said that the full orbed Chautauqua idea must awaken in all genuine souls a fresh enthusiasm in true living and bring rich and poor, learned and unlearned into neighborship and comradeship, helpful and honorable to both. Um, so, you know, education, once the peculiar privilege of the few must in our best earthly estate become the valued possession of the many. Um, and during this time, land grant institutions across the country like Penn State were also becoming a part of this movement. Penn State offered correspondence courses in the 1800s and as technologies evolved, so did distance education. Um, so a, a really basic idea to note here is that distance education has always provided opportunity to those people who could not attend courses on a campus or in a school. Um, these have traditionally been working adults or people who lived in rural areas and often people who were less privileged. So distance education has always been about opening up access to education to all and it's opened up uh, opportunities for lifelong learning. So next uh, slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so as you can see here in this uh, graphic, um, distance education has evolved as technologies have emerged. And as I mentioned in the last slide, the postal service was used, then radio, then there was telephone, there was television, satellites, uh, videotapes, CDs, cassette tapes, they've all been used. Um, and now we find ourselves in the era of the internet and World Wide Web. Um, at Penn State in the program uh, that I'm currently a faculty member in, uh, Dr. Michael Graham Moore first developed graduate courses that taught about the field of distance education and the study of distance education. Uh, in the 1970s, he was a research assistant uh, in Wisconsin for uh, a gentleman called Charles Wedemeyer. Uh, and Wedemeyer was working with Moore and some other pioneers in the field. Uh, I don't have time to go into all that whole uh, history, but um, one of the, Moore ended up coming back to Penn State as a faculty member in the adult ed program. And uh, one of the most important people at Penn State was Marlo Froke, who was responsible for overseeing correspondence education. And he was also a director of broadcasting and established WPSX TV uh, in the 60s. 
And then in the 80s, he was in a unit called the Division of Media and Learning Resources. And he started thinking about how television could also be engaging. And they started printing out materials that accompanied the programs that they could distribute to viewers. Um, Marlo Froke worked with Dr. Moore. He supported the establishment of the American Center for the Study of Distance Ed, which I'm now the director of. And um, he um, helped to uh, merge WPSX with the, with the University Division of Instructional Services. They worked with K-12 and higher ed. Um, and then in 1992, Penn State uh, had a task force that decided that distance ed should play a more major role. And in 1994, two years later, Dr. Gary Miller took over and his charge was to implement that vision. Um, Penn State worked with AT&T, the Sloan Foundation, and then in the 90s, it was determined that online education should be pursued. World Campus opened up in 1998 with 450 students. And within 10 years, there were over 10,000 students and 70 degree and certificate programs. In the early 2000s, WPSX was renamed WPSU. And aside from the practice that I've talked about uh, here, uh, there, there's been 40 years of formal research that shows that distance education can be just as, if not more effective, as face-to-face -face or in-person learning. Okay, next please. Okay, so there are a lot of terms that people use when they refer to teaching and learning at a distance. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, you can see a lot of terms up here on the screen. You've no doubt heard terms such as remote learning, e-learning, online learning, uh, mobile learning, uh, and, uh, and others. Um, so the way that I hope that people will begin to think about the topic we're covering tonight is that you could think about all of these terms that you've heard as being under the umbrella of uh, distance education and the field of distance education. And next slide. So what is distance education? How is it defined? Um, the, the definition on the screen is, is a widely accepted definition. Um, it's planned learning that normally occurs in a different place from teaching. It requires special techniques of course design and instruction, communication through various technologies, and special organizational and administrative arrangement. All right. So this slide um, illustrates a few ways of thinking about different modes of education. Um, we have in-person education. That's what most people are used to. Distance education is over on the right um, in the yellow circle. And then you have blended, which is a combination of both distance education and in-person education. Um, you can see down in the, in the corner, we've illustrated um, crisis distance education because many schools in K-12 districts um, don't have a distance education in place. So they went into crisis management mode early in the year when they had to close in, uh, when they had to close uh, and went from in-person to whatever they decided to call it. Most were calling it remote learning at the time. Um, so um, another major point I'd like to make today um, is that you may not have experience or you may not currently be in this situation. Um, you know, people are, everyone's doing their best to go into this crisis mode and to deliver, um, deliver uh, education from a distance. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to get people to think into the future and to think about how their systems can change and evolve so that um, districts can, um, can shift and they can uh, also uh, provide quality education no matter what the circumstances are. And this actually, um, you know, some students actually excel at a distance. Um, and it's all about the, how the system is developed and the design of uh, 
the courses and everything that's involved with that. This is a point where we just wanted to take a pause and give you an opportunity to share with us what your comfort level is uh, as either an educator or as a parent or whatever your, your role has been and your experience so far. Um, you can also uh, add any comments or questions that you like at this point. And then think about some of the successes that you've seen uh, with this remote learning or distance education uh, and some of the challenges as well. So it's kind of an open, open question uh, for you to just share some, some thoughts with us at this point. So feel free to either um, unmute your microphone and share, or you can type it in the chat um, if that's more comfortable for you. I see there are some memories of uh, VHS tapes that Melissa is a. Uh... And a comment about being feeling more confident now that the time has gone on. Yeah, I can understand that. And that's great. That's great to hear. Okay. And um, yeah, Andrea is talking about um, implementing with a co teacher or co leader. And that's, yeah, that's great. We've, uh, you know, we've been, like Peggy said, we've been working with the, the Department of Ed and um, we're really encouraging districts to think about how they can set up teams uh, and have people work together um, to uh, take some of the, the burden off. And, and that's actually, you know, we won't uh, go into too much detail tonight, but, you know, the system is just made up of a lot of support and a lot of teams that work together to, to uh, make uh, distance education a, a high quality happen. Okay, so um, we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive into you know what distance education systems look like, and then uh, Rebecca and uh, Will will go even deeper with some of the systems that we uh, talk about when we talk about distance education. So I think first and foremost, as you look at this um, Venn diagram, that you see that learning is at the center and not technology. And so in our view of distance education, technology supports learning, not the other way around. And also, and, and this is probably a, you know, a developmental process for many districts, um, distance education isn't all, is not intended to replicate the face-to-face -face classroom. And some of you may have experienced that at the beginning with six hour Zooms, or maybe you're still doing that. Um, and so we're gonna ask you to maybe to think differently about that as we start talking about uh, facilitation and modalities and teaching and learning. But anyway, in our model, um, we, we think about systems and some of these systems will be familiar to you and maybe others may not. So in a systems model, um, each like component has a relationship to each other and they are impacted by each other. And hence, that's why we use a, a Venn diagram. They're inter interdependent. But of course, you know, teaching, you know, for those of you who are educators, on this um, on this webinar tonight, know that teaching has to be supported by leadership, which is in one of our systems. It has to be just su supported by curriculum design and development. And you're going to hear more from Rebecca about it has to be su supported by different facilitation types and modalities like face to face, hybrid and remote. And of course, it has to be supported by our knowledge about what we know about effective teaching. In addition to that, with attention to like equity and inclusion because we know like the this pandemic really exposed lots of vulnerabilities some of you are really more familiar with what's happening in terms of food distribution poverty you know housing insecurity 
lack of internet access, all of those things. And so that's gonna be important in this model to think about. And also like the community and all the stakeholders, like how, how to rethink and maybe reconceptualize the, the um, ways that we work with communities and also our stakeholders in the way we work with parents. I think we've all discovered that um, parents are a central part of this, particularly now uh, because of the necessary involvement of parents from home required when people move to remote and virtual. So in the next, um, you know, that's the overview, just understanding that there, there, are, there are systems within the distance education system, all of which are important. All of those things can't be put in place all at once, but attention needs to be paid to those um, and, and to create a plan so that changes can be made incrementally and over time. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Rebecca and she's gonna talk about facility facilitation and modality. Thank you, Peggy. So for tonight, I'd really like to focus on facilitation and modality components within the system of distance education. And facilitation models are really based oh. on time and space variables uh, between the student and the teacher. Oh. Excuse me for a second here. Um, all right, so facilitation models are based upon time and space variables between the student oh. and the teacher. And what I mean about this is the distance between time and space. <clears throat> so for the most part, the majority of everyone joining us tonight is located across Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I'm gonna probably have to take a, a break for a second here. I have a, a hound dog and she is relentless. <laughs> so so um, give me a moment um, to, to get some assistance here. <laughs> That's an important part of distance education is authenticity. And we're all seeing that these kind of things happen in all of our places and they bring a little bit of color and flavor to who we are as, as individuals. So that's right. Second, she'll be right with us. <laughs> yeah. I'll go down through the chat here and just take a take a look. Yep, Melissa's sharing that collaboration is key. <laughs> Split the work, and that's that's great. Um, well, I apologize for that. She has been good all day, but she has realized that it's close to dinner time and wanted to, to remind me of that. Um, and so to that point, what I was saying was that facilitation models are really based upon time and space variables between the student and the teacher. And so what I mean by time and space is that for the most part, the majority of us joining this evening are located across Pennsylvania. However, I'm joining today from California. So I'm literally three hours behind you and also 3000 miles away. And yet we're able to use Zoom to close the gap on both our time and space variables and meet here together. This also means that content technologies and social media also act as tools to help close the gap between um, those variables of time and space. And so I just wanna walk through one of these um, sub subsystems of the larger distance education system that Peggy shared with us earlier. And the facilitation model is really the instructional process that is structured on our synchronous, asynchronous, and blended approaches, that, that uh, visual that, that Will shared earlier as well. And the next piece, which you're going to hear me say quite a lot, is multimodal content. And this is a real favorite of mine because it provides the most universal and equitable approach to meet the personal needs, the preferences and experiences of your students. This means the inclusive combination of mediums, which are text, video, and audio, and they enable students to interact in a multitude of ways within the content. Uh, technologies, something that we're all quite familiar with, is the range of hardware and software that can be integrated into educational environments. So in the field of distance education, some would even argue that distance learning was accelerated after the emergence of the printing press. And that was the first time that books became um, available to more people. Uh, getting back to Will's point addressed earlier, it's all about access. And so books are really an example of how one could learn at their own time and space. And social media, um, necessary evil, it seems these days, is also a means of mass communication 
uh, that uses interactive technology to enable participants to create and exchange information across their communities and their networks. And so when we think about these uh, components within our system, we really want to direct your attention to how these could be applied into your context using some guiding questions. And so the first one is, what technologies are required to ensure equitable learning and teaching? The second one is, what resources will you need to provide to ensure that the content is equitable for all students? And the third one, uh, which may or may not apply, is what is the role, if any, that social media would have in effective teaching and learning? And the fourth one is how does the facilitation model or models uh, meet the needs of all of your learners? So these are just some guiding questions, but things that we can take uh, parts of that higher um, systems model and think about how we can apply those within our own individual context. And I wanna quickly move on to our next subsystem, uh, which is could design I, and development. Could I interrupt um, you just one second, Rebecca? Sure. I'm not seeing the slides advance. Is it? Is anybody else having? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, now man. I Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. Uh, just go back. I didn't realize they weren't being shared. Um, yeah. So this was the model I was walking you through, where the facilitation models, uh, the multimodal content, uh, technologies is at the bottom, and social media. And these are all really just a sub. Uh, system within that larger system that uh, Peggy shared with us. And these are the questions that I was um, guiding us through. And I'm just going to take a moment to make sure they're all available on your screen and, and we can take a time um, to just think about those and reflect upon how they could be applied to our individual context. Sorry about that. So just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to design and development. And as Peggy said, there's a lot here that we could discuss this evening. Um, but for tonight, we had planned to discuss three interaction types and how they can apply to an inclusive design framework. And so the first one is student to teacher. This is what we are most common. Um, we use and what we're aware of. But in distance education, the teacher becomes more of a facilitator role and, and puts learning in the center. Um, that is their approach to instruction, how they set their expectations and provide feedback to uh, the student. The next one is student to student. And this is really um, looking at the equality and making sure that one student doesn't have authority over another but also looking at ways that students can communicate with one another, um, analyze each other's work, encourage one another's thoughts, and engage with one another. Sometimes this might occur in a discussion forum, for example. And the third one, uh, which, which again is getting back to multimodal content, is looking at how students are engaging with learning content and all of those media types. Um, but this is also assuming that the content is well prepared and organized and students are able to access it. So based upon those three interaction types, student to student, student to teacher, and student to content, we're just gonna take a moment here to pause to see which interaction you're most comfortable implementing. And Will says he's agreeable to all three. <laughs> yeah. I was I was adding that. No, I know. I, I was adding that so that folks can. Uh... Yes, please uh, feel free to, to um, share in the chat area. And I'm I'm going to probably move on from this because I apologize since my uh, my dog made a, a special visit. Um, because there's a lot that we can cover here that I think are that's um, very 
uh, meaningful to our own practices. And so looking at an inclusive design framework, there are really four different guidelines uh, to help us with the design and development. And the first one is very critical. It's to design for your most vulnerable. Um, one of the things that our project team has been talking about a lot is that educators are also instructional designers. So every decision that you make is also a learning design decision. Um, and some of the things that have been very critical to us in our conversations has been really saying, let's return to curriculum standards and look at the assessment and the evaluation and make sure that these um, decisions that we're making are aligned to this process. And getting onto that conversation of process is getting back to what Will was saying earlier, is that distance education is very planned. It's intentional, it's systematic. And that doesn't matter if it's a highly structured learning experience or a very organic independent learning experience. And when we look at what inclusive design is, the definition that it means to us is that you're not designing for one thing for one person, but something for all. You're designing a diversity of ways for folks to participate so that everyone has a sense of belonging. And shared here are some guiding questions, um, things that you can think about how you can apply these to your own practice. But we have identified there are plenty of opportunities to support inclusion. And that could be advocating for open educational resources and practices, um, looking at solutions to reduce barriers within course design, which includes language translation, again, multimodal strategies to support learner characteristics and preferences. Um, we also are advocating for flexible learning and assessment strategies and looking at ways that we can address student identity and agency. Um, realizing right now that one of the goals that we are we're trying to achieve is establishing communication channels uh, to develop relationships and community as students interact with their content, their teachers, and also their peers. And under this umbrella of inclusive design is also universal design for learning and the design of an environment so that it might be assessed and used in the widest possible range of situations uh, without the need for adaptation. Hey, Rebecca, I'm going to interrupt you again. The slides don't seem- Yeah, they're not following. Moving. Yeah. Um, Oh man, I'm so sorry. I don't know yeah. why this is happening. Yeah. Um, I, should have <laughs> okay. I should have jumped in earlier. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so these were the, the guidelines that we were sharing. Um, I also want to take a moment uh, to also look at some of the guiding questions that we were provided uh, with inclusive design, um, because these are very critical in ways that we can adapt and adopt them to our own particular practices. Um, I'll give you just a moment to, to review those. And I believe the PowerPoint, we can make this available after the webinar. Feel free to um, yes. share your, your emails as well. Uh, definitely, if you send it to me, Rebecca, I, which you've already sent one version, but if you send this one, I can share it out with anyone who wants it because I'll share my email at the end, so. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so just universal design, uh, moving on here is the design of the environment so that it can be accessed in um, the widest range possible so that you don't need to adapt for it. And as an instructional designer, we would say that universal design is just good design. It's not always clear what this means for digital learning design, however, um, because most examples of universal design um, are typically applied to like a sidewalk with the curb cutouts or kitchen utensils. So what do we think about when this is applied to online learning? Um, we could say that one of the best strategies that we've seen in response to the COVID crisis has have been to develop class and curriculum templates um, as a way to efficiently scale consistency and support UDL across the program of study. And finally, um, under this umbrella of inclusive design is also accessibility compliance, which is really, really critical. When we say accessibility, we're saying this addresses the discriminatory aspects related to equivalent user experience for people with disabilities. And web accessibility means that people with disabilities can equally receive, understand, navigate, and interact with websites and tools. And it means that they can contribute equally without barriers. Um, 
we also want to just discuss briefly about how mobile learning can address connectivity issues, but also mobile design principles have um, a focus on intuitive and uh, simple interfaces, which are also closely aligned to UDL and accessibility practices. So features like voice recognition um, and the ability to zoom in on a text uh, can help support students with disabilities, but it can also afford younger learners who may have um, difficulty using a, a full-fledged keyboard. Um, there's plenty of tools out there to help with, um, with accessibility. Math equations, for example, should include um, an editor such as MathML or LaTeX. We also look at other technologies that can support accessibility accommodations, such as JAWS or Kurzweil, um, tools that help read text to speech, note-taking support, extended due dates, dictation tools, um, and also tools that can help with vision, hearing, and tactile support. And so this is something that we have to be very um, aware of and also ensure that we're being compliant. And so I'd like to move on to teaching, just making sure that everything is still showing. <laughs> Um, yep, and so, it, <laughs> uh, so teaching, again, there are a lot of components within the subsystem of distance education. Um, but for this evening, I really wanted to share 12 golden rules that can, um, that are brought to us by one of the leading scholars in the field, and his name is Tony Bates. And I'd like to just kind of walk through each one of these because we have found them to be just really helpful guiding principles to distance education. And the first one really, really resonates with us. And that is that good teaching is important and technology is never going to save bad teaching. So good teaching matters. And that includes learning objectives, structuring your content, applying relevant to meaning to meet those um, needs of your learners. Uh, it also means that designing effective learning experiences with the most appropriate technology is highly contextual. So what you might use in your art classroom may not apply to your math classroom. At World Campus, we might develop or utilize a tool in one of our graduate engineering courses, but that tool would not possibly apply for our freshman psychology course. Um, and then we also, getting back to uh, multimedia and multimodal content, is ensuring that we are applying the appropriate aesthetics for each medium. So making sure that, that choosing a visual is the most important way to share or communicate that information, uh, rather than maybe a, a text uh, blurb that's three pages long. So just thinking and being very cognizant about the media that we're utilizing and incorporating. Uh, some of the other things that we want to focus on is how understanding technologies can help us find loopholes or apply technology in a variety of ways to support lear the learning experience. And this might include the way that we would use Google Docs, for example. Not only is it a word processing system that can help us uh, develop a paper for, um, for an assignment submission, but it's also a tool that we often utilize in our Zoom meetings and our other synchronous meetings as a way for students to reflect and collaborate with one another on some of the concepts that are being shared. So thinking about how um, technology can be uh, repurposed, uh, maybe not for the initial intent, but can be used in other ways to help with the learning experience. This also gets to my next point, which is that there is no super technology, right? So often technologies need help from other technologies to combine their powers to support each other's weaknesses and leverage their strengths. We see this often with Canvas, right? There's a lot of LTI integrations and tools that we can incorporate in there because Canvas may not fulfill all needs in the learning environment. So thinking about how we can utilize a various uh, selection of tools is very helpful. The next one, again, I'm sorry, multimodal content. Um, utilizing all types of media to support learner preferences and characteristics um, as provided here. Uh, the next three is getting back to interaction. It's essential and distance education requires peer-to-peer, student-to-instructor, and student-to-content. And those are all critical for the distance learning experience. 
some of the other things that we need to think about are the economies of scale. There is a lot of costs um, and challenges and economics to technology that we must consider. They often can um, create challenges and barriers, but they also help us constrain our design decisions. Uh, so we need to think about, you know, what are the costs and the economics, but also the licensing and how we can scale a technology uh, beyond just one classroom, but potentially over an entire school district or community. Um, and the last one on this particular slide is that technology should not be determined by a, a date stamp. So often the newest technologies are not readily accessible, getting back to economies of scale, but also thinking about um, how students are utilizing them and ensuring that they're inclusive to all students, um, their teachers, their parents, and the community. So high quality education is really not contingent upon the latest tool. And to wrap up um, our last three golden principles, um, multimedia and uh, multidisciplinary teams that help leverage our skills and experience and knowledge are very critical as we think about what teamwork looks like and how we can implement and use technology in educational purposes. We also want to draw attention that professional development, um, those needs need to be supported with both training and how the technology can be used to support learning and pedagogy. Uh, so it's really a two part piece here. It's not really uh, just how to use the technology itself. And finally, the last one is technology is not the question, right? So we really want to define how, what, and where do I want students to learn? And once you're able to address those important questions, technology can support and, and help provide you um, the best opportunity on how students can learn while using technology. And so at that note, uh, my dog has stayed away and <laughs> I'm gonna hand the mic back over uh, to, to Will to wrap up and discuss learning. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the main point here is that <clears throat> like Rebecca was just talking about technology should not be your focus, right? You need technology um, to make some of the, this happen, but focus on the learning. You know, are your classes student-centered or teacher-centered? Um, what are your learning objectives? How can you design a class in the mode that you are working in at the time? And then another thing that, um, you know, I wanna also point out, out is, Think about the whole system. You know, if you're a teacher, you know, a lot of teachers are probably feel like they're out there on their own, but it takes an entire system to, um, to make high quality distance education happen, right? So think about the entire system and think about ways that you can, um, you can reach out to your superintendents, or some folks are talking about um, collaborating with other other teachers. You know, what resources in the system can you pull upon to to make things happen? And also, um, look to the community and look to the parents. You know, it it it, um, it takes the entire system to to make this happen. Um, and this slide, um, you know, really is about learning. Um, centered and student-centered uh, learning, right? Um, we've listed some of the benefits of distance education here. Um, I won't read these all off to you. Um, we can take a, you know, you can uh, take a look at this while I'm uh, making a final point here. Um, but there really are a lot of benefits to distance education and, um, I encourage everybody to think about um, the situation that we're in as an opportunity um, to help evolve uh, both your teaching uh, and the system that you're you're in. You know, it's a, this is a really good opportunity that we have right now. I know that it's stressful, and um, you know, it, it it's been really difficult. But um, I think we most people will agree that. This is not, we are not going to 
go back to a what was normal in the past completely. So we have to look at our classrooms and our system so that we can move forward. Um, and um, I just want to also say that um, one of the benefits, this is, this is a lot about, this slide is talking about um, students and the benefits to students, but there is a lot of research out there that shows that teachers who teach at a distance end up going back to their classrooms and improving their teaching methods in the classroom as well. So again, it's an opportunity to really think about, about student-centered learning and, um, and to, to uh, evolve and to learn. You know, we're all lifelong learners. That's what it's all about. And, um, and you're gonna make mistakes, that's okay. You know, we all learn from mistakes and, and move on. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say while I still have the mic is, please feel free to reach out if you want to just have discussions or uh, or you need anything. You know, uh, I'm around. I know Peggy and, and Rebecca are are also around, so um, we're really happy to to meet with you um, and to discuss any of this later. So I guess I grabbed I grabbed the last slide just just to reiterate a couple things. Um, you know, while this has caused, you know, some pain points for all of us, I think that the pandemic has also kind of revealed enormous potential to like think about how we can better serve each child and maybe to think about what modality and what way of teaching and learning is best for which children. And right now we're sort of flipping from everybody face to face, everybody remote hybrid. And maybe in the future, we'll be thinking about well, this child does better in a face to face, this child does better in a hybrid, this child maybe does better in a remote and, and thinking more in terms of what students need to know and be able to do. But the other thing I would say, I'm gonna put my principal and former central office administrator hat on and ask you to think about, remember when you were a first year teacher and you weren't perfect. I know I cry every day for the first like six months I taught. Um, you weren't perfect, you made a lot of mistakes, but you did improve with practice. You got mentoring from somebody, you know, maybe the teacher next door, or you, ha you had a formal mentor, you attended professional development, and you did a lot of personal reflection in that first year. And I think for many of us, this year feels like that first year of teaching again, because we were thrust into an unknown way of thinking about teaching. But I want to I want to encourage you like to really celebrate your accomplishments and think about the things that that you know really matter as teachers like you know focus on building relationships and student engagement is really really critical and focusing on how you're going to help kids get to those learning goals and I think if you start to think about those three interactions that Rebecca talked about and start to think about you know how you're planning your instruction you know you're still an educator you didn't forget how to teach so um, we want to we want to open it up now for questions because this is a lot of information and we would love to hear your questions and you know have a dialogue with you. I did notice there was one question um, from Melissa. She was asking, I believe, when Will was speaking about increasing teacher control. Um, Melissa, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all or. Um, or if, if you all can answer, but I just noticed that question was in there. I'm wondering about, uh, I, I think I need a little bit more information. Teacher control over what, maybe? I was thinking maybe that was prompted by my comment of um, saying that when I was talking about the uh, support that teachers need in the system. I don't know if that's when that question came up or not. Um, uh, feel, okay, the, I see. So I feel less control online. Okay. Yeah, so there's some, uh, some of the things that are, you know, I think one question to ask yourself is what is it that you want to control and what can you let go? That's always a question. So um, part of the challenge here is trying to figure out how, you know, the balance between kids working independently and the balance between a level of support. You know, when, 
you know, I, I was really involved in literacy. We talk a lot about to, with, and by, you know, that we do a lot of modeling and then we work with kids together and then we set them loose to kind of practice independently. So that, that can feel uncomfortable, um, you know, particularly online because you don't see them when you send them off to centers necessarily like you would in a classroom. Um, but I think there are ways to think about how can you, just as in a center, I used to say to teachers all the time, you can send kids to center, but how do you know what they're doing? So do you have ways for kids to hold themselves accountable and report back to you or pr produce a product that is given to you that demonstrates their learning from that center? You know, there are ways to have that kind of control. Oh, so another question, we can't require attendance at Zoom time. Yeah, for, yeah. Um, so that's interesting too. So another question to ask you to think about is, does attendance mean you are or are not learning? So I can, in, in, the, in the words of my now 30 year old, when he first entered high school, I asked him on his first day what he learned. He told me he, could, he learned that he could sit in a class and smile at the teacher and she thought he was paying attention. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, we have to start thinking about, do you have to be there every day to learn? Or is it more about, um, or is it more about you have to be able to meet the learning goal? And I might be able to meet the learning goal sooner or later than some other people. So that's something, something to think about. And that's a really hard concept to wrap your head around. And I'll, I'll just add that it, it, it takes some, um, some thinking about the design of of your class or or the um, and taking a look at the learning objectives like Peggy was just talking about and and can you do that um, can they do that offline you know do you can you um, set up uh, asynchronous uh, exercises for them to do so that they're they're working or maybe they're working with other students too you know think about those other modes of um, of interaction. Yeah, and of I would also go ahead. Sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. I would also say that it's it's also shifting our perception of the terminology. So I I realize that attendance is a critical factor and a way for us to um, have some metrics on learning. But in distance education, we often say participation and just showing that students are participating, and that can come again, in a multitude of ways, going back to those three interactions. Are they participating in a discussion forum? Are they working with their peers? Um, one way that we often design assessment strategies to that is a self-reflection. Uh, just saying, like, I feel like I've been present and participating in all of these opportunities, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous. Um, some other ways you could do that is just like a learning journal or a blog, a way that students can demonstrate their learning um, but it may not really replicate itself as attendance, but more of that of active participation. Yeah, and on a really practical matter as a principal and you know, state policies right now around attendance data is a real thing for teachers in schools. Like, you know, uh, daily membership is really important. Attendance data is used for a lot of really important purposes in Pennsylvania. So it may not be totally attainable, because you still have to figure that out. Although the Department of Education did relax some of that during the pandemic to allow schools to think about other ways to do that. So that's a good thing. And I think the other thing, the comment I just saw come up is really, really important, right? Discourse. I mean, part of what we're gonna be doing, we're working with this PDE, um, we're gonna launch a big series tomorrow is really to your point, getting a common language to start having the discourse around this. Cause this is a sea change. I mean, it, it's a sea change and it's gonna require a lot of conversation, a lot of discourse, a lot of uh, identification of terms. You know, think about it when, when you first started thinking about literacy instruction or, you know, you started talking about guided reading and what that meant and, you know, we were all over the place with our understanding about that. So it's gonna take the same thing. Other questions? This has been 
a really great discussion. Um, like I said, you can feel free to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question or um, if we run out of questions for this chat, we'll be able to share emails and you can ask questions if you have things that come up later too. So give it another minute or two to see if there's any other questions that come up. Yeah, or even uh, comments about successes, you know, that you've you've had or particular challenges that, that you that you see. While you're thinking, um, I also want to invite you over to the American Center for DistanceEducation.com. Um, we have an ongoing series of discussions and talks with experts in the field of distance education. They're all open and free. They happen uh, at all times of, uh, of the week and different days, uh, but there is an ongoing series and we've had some really interesting discussions with educators from around the world. Um, everyone's facing this situation and uh, I've learned an awful lot from people um, all over the globe who are, who are um, having, having challenges and, and having a lot of success too with what you know, things that they're doing. The last thing I want to mention, um, and in looking over the list of districts that are participating, um, I just want to let you know that if you're a teacher, there are people in your district, you're maybe, you're, maybe you're even part of a team of principals and um, superintendents and intermediate unit folks that are going to be participating in a, in a five-part series um, to really, really to to dissect this stuff and to identify, you know, how to move forward. And I put in the um, chat a, um, a site where eventually um, people can go, well, they can go there now, um, to discuss issues around distance learning. As, and um, we invite you to, you know, look at that as well and, and, and put in your questions there and maybe look for that information coming from your principals about the, the upcoming series of webinars that are gonna be available. And some of you may already be involved. Okay, there is a comment here um, about the hybrid format um, is, is very challenging um, for when the teachers on Zoom and students are in the classroom at the same time. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. And I think, you know, with a lot of things, um, it takes practice. You know, I mean, if you think about it, you're probably feeling pretty mechanical about it right now. You're probably making some mistakes and that's pretty normal. But as you practice that, you'll become more fluid, fluid with actually utilizing the technology to do that so you can focus more on your teaching. And I think I'd say be patient with yourself because that's just the natural way um, learning occurs for adults too, right? We have to practice, we make mistakes and then we get better at it. And, and that's, that's normal. And I think if, you, if you're patient with yourself that way, kids will also, you'll present that attitude to them too, that it's okay to make these mistakes. We're all learning this. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, like Peggy was just saying, I'd encourage you to come over to the, to the website that she shared. There's a forum there, and that's a great question to bring up. I'm sure you would get feedback, you know, um, on that topic. All right, so um, thank you all for attending, and thank you to our presenters. I wish we could give you a round of applause, but I guess we can do virtual round of applause. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us today. And um, if you could share the slides, that would be great. And then I can share them out with anyone who's interested in them. Um, if you are looking to get Act 48 credits, I'm gonna put um, some information for you in the chat. And if you can send me an email, um, then I will reply with a um, survey for you to take um, and then we can help you apply for Act 48 credits. So any other final questions before we close out?
I think it was very helpful for me as um, a non-formal educator as well, because I'm creating distance learning and supporting teachers in that role. So I thank you for all of this information as well. All right. Well, the speakers will be hanging out for just a minute or two. So if you think of anything else and otherwise, I um, hope you all have a great evening.